What is exile? Well, at the most basic level, you know, exile is where you are forced out of your home country and you live as a stranger in a strange land. And so you can see it already in Genesis 3, verses 23 and 24, where our first parents are driven out of paradise and they're forced to kind of live outside of the presence of God. But that motif is enlarged. You begin to recognize the fact that, you know, Israel in Egyptian bondage, far from their own homeland, the promised land, and then the early church fathers pick up on the fact that this bondage into which we are born is a sign of original sin. Hello and welcome to another Perusia podcast. I'm Shabal Reish, your host, and very excited uh, to introduce to you arguably one of the most influential theologians in the world, biblical theologians. Um, I learned about this man about 23 years ago. I can't believe that. At a time when I needed uh, to learn about the Trinity, about our, our church, about uh, the teachings of our faith and about the Bible. And uh, it just came alive and uh, is written dozens and dozens and dozens of books including this most recent one, um, Catholics in Exile. It's none other than the president of St. Paul Center, a professor at uh, Franciscan University, Steubenville, and a great all-round Catholic who was teaching the faith on fire, Dr. Scott Hahn. Hello, Dr. Hahn, how are you? Wonderful to be with you, Sherbal. We're doing very well. It's, it's great to see you. Uh, congratulations. I, I understand uh, you have just completed the building of the St. Paul Center. Um, can you give us a quick update? Uh, is that now operational? And, and what's the latest with that? It is not fully operational yet, but we're already moving in. And right. I did my very first recording in my brand new office uh, just a few hours ago. We still have a lot more equipment. We also have the fire code. We have the building department to sign off so that when we get final approval, I would say by the year's end, we will be moved in and by early January, we will be fully operational. We have our big ribbon cutting on January 25th, which is okay. the Feast of the Conversion of St. Paul. And so for me, it is a, a very auspicious moment because two or three years ago, I think friends of mine who were close to me about this project especially would have called me a sort of COVID skeptic because I wasn't really, I wasn't convinced by all of the negative dire warnings, but obviously it was a tragedy. I was also something of a building skeptic. I wasn't convinced we would ever have a building. And so unless the Lord builds the house, well, he has. And this 25,000 square foot building is on wow. two acres directly across the street from Franciscan University of Steubenville, where I've taught now for over 33 years. And so it is exciting to say the least. It's almost uh, surreal to be more precise. And so we have a team of over 40 full-time co-workers who will be moving in and mobilizing. And we're going to be doing so many new and exciting things in the in 2024 there in our new headquarters. Oh, praise God. Now, congratulations on all that and your consistency, your persistence, your dedication, loyalty, and, and your vision. I remember it was, dec How, when did St. Paul Center begin? Just out of curiosity. Almost 25 years ago. I remember wow. when I was talking to the first prospect. Um, uh, she asked me, are you watching TV? And I said, no, why should I? She said, uh, you, you ought to tune in to see what happened to the Twin Towers. So it was wow. the morning of 9-11. I'll never forget that. Uh, she ended up not accepting our offer and she went on to do wonderful things. But uh, later that week, we were able to identify David Warner as our first full-timer who came and joined us. But uh, so going all the way back to 9-11 is when we had our start. And over the years, we have grown gradually. But in the last 10 years, we've also grown somewhat exponentially. Uh, and it's really exciting for us to be partnering with you, Charbel, and, you know, to have seen you now a number of times, but also to have seen you uh, at Ogle Bay for the priest conference uh, just yes. about a year ago or more. Uh, right. That was to say exciting, <laughs> again, that's understating it. And we're so grateful and proud of the apostolate you're doing down under. 
Thank you. Well, I've been inspired by your work uh, personally um, and um, encouraged. And, and I want to thank you because it's not only helped uh, many Americans, it's helped many Australians, including myself and, and many people on this side of the world or across the Asia Pacific world, New Zealanders and Malaysians and Singaporeans and Filipinos who, who watch this show. So, so thank you for, your, for, for all you've done. Um, we're only getting warmed up and I'm very excited. So I feel yeah. like uh, 2024 is, is that next step. Uh, we, we've got the, we're, something so we're around the corner of the next big thing. And, and so I'm really excited about um, what God has planned for, for us. In the time, it's, a, it's interesting because we're, we're speaking with hope and, and joy and at a time when the culture, it, it, it sort of speaks the opposite. Right now we're in despair. We're in, um, there's, a, there's a high rise of depression, anxiety loneliness, division. It's been, I don't remember it being so polarizing in my life. Um, we watch a bit of American politics. We've seen how bad that is uh, as far as uh, people's views. We're even seeing church politics. And so this is coming inside our very family um, and, and it's very polarizing. You've addressed a lot of this, uh, Dr. Hahn, in, in this book, and that's what I want to unpack, uh, the Catholics in exile. It was, this is definitely inspired by the Holy Spirit, the timing of it. Um, I remember hearing you just a few months ago and you, you spoke at the Catholic Answers Conference and you, you pretty much did almost like a combination. You sort of were talking about this and this uh, at the same time. And I remember thinking, wow, and, and, and looking in the room, over 800 people in the room, uh, and we've got some of the world's best apologists sitting in the room. Uh, Doctor, uh, I mean, we've got uh, Chris Check and Tim Staples and Jimmy Aiken and Trent Horn and Carlo Broussard and all this Joe Heschmeyer and these, this great team over there. And they were just soaking in. It was like we were listening to a, uh, and sorry to maybe embarrass you, but speaking to a, listening to our, our, our godfather or our grandfather, <laughs> sort of the words of wisdom um, that was coming out. And you were basically reminding us that this is not sort of brand new. What, you know, we, we faced this before. We faced this in history. And you went back in the Old Testament and reminded us about those first civilizations and um, could you tell us just a bit about, I guess, what inspired this book um, and its connection to the other books um, to start yeah. with? So, you know, you mentioned uh, the fact that this is part of a series and it isn't the first time I've done a trilogy. You know, I just, uh, I, I can't take credit though, because when I did the Lamb's Supper back around the year 2000, uh, that was the first book that I did with uh, Doubleday. And I was excited by the reception, uh, but I never imagined that there'd be a sequel. But then I realized as I was traveling around sharing with people, they would keep asking about the fourth cup, which was sort mm -hmm. of part of the Lamb's Supper. And so eventually I got around to writing the fourth cup. And then I recognized the fact that much of what I've been sharing that has helped so much is this discovery that I made. It was sort of hiding in plain view that when you study the New Testament, the New Testament never calls itself the New Testament. The only time Jesus uses that phrase is in when he's instituting the Eucharist. And so I, I wrote a third book that made up that trilogy called uh, Consuming the Word, the New Testament and the Eucharist in the early church, where I try to show that the New Testament was the Eucharist in the early church uh, long before it became a document. And so I had a sense of closure. I mean, I'm still always sharing, especially here in America, where you have this three-year National Eucharistic Revival. Mm. But about four years ago, I published a book. And in a way, it was similar to The Lamb's Supper because it was a book that I had inside of me for a while. It was called The First Society, The Sacrament of Matrimony and the Restoration of the Social Order. In fact, that's it right there. Uh, in the opening chapter, I share an experience that I'd had years before. I mean, uh, going all the way back to 1985, when I was still a Protestant, enrolled in the doctoral program at Marquette, and my mentor, Father Donald Keefe, was uh, leading us in a seminar discussion slash debate with Protestants and evangelicals about what role, if any, religion plays in the public square, in our own social order in a secular society like America. And it was a polarizing conversation in some ways. And Father Keefe let it go on until finally he just sort of began lecturing again and then suddenly interrupted himself and looking out the window said something I'll never ever forget. And that is, 
If Catholics simply lived the grace of the sacrament of matrimony, for one generation, the result would be a transformed social order, a, ca a Catholic, a Christian culture. And at first, you know, I'm thinking that's hyperbole. I mean, it's, it's, it's good rhetoric, but I don't think it's real. And then as I sat there listening to him, I realized, you know what? That might be one of the most true statements I'll ever hear, even if I don't live to see it. And so I just thought about it in the process of becoming a Catholic and recognizing the depth of the sacraments. The, the sacraments are what make it make it, it makes it possible for us to become saints, but it's not easy to become a saint. It's not automatic for sure. We're not robots. But when I did that book, I ended up having a lot of conversations with Brandon McGinley about the common good, about Christian political action, about political theology. And you had in America, you know, uh, Patrick Deneen, uh, who was celebrating the end of liberalism in a book that I found very useful. And I struck up a friendship with Professor Deneen of Notre Dame and also with Robbie George and other people. And Brandon, my co-author, was in fact a former student of Robbie George. And I don't want to get, you know, uh, I don't want to bore our, our viewers, but Brandon was coming to see things in a, in a new way. And I also was, but it was traceable way back to the mid eighties. And so as a result of the conversations that we had, we outlined, it is right and just now, why the future of civilization depends on true religion. And I must admit, I had so much fun working with Brandon back and forth. I mean, we weren't altering each other's fundamental views but we were really shifting and, and, and seeing things more clearly and profoundly, I believe. And so we worked on this to show that it is more than just uh, a line lifted from the liturgy. It is right and just. It is our duty and our salvation to give God thanks and praise always and everywhere, rooted in the virtue of religion, which is not just in the Bible, but in the tradition of natural law where you love God above all things because he's God and you love your neighbor as yourself, but for the love of God. And so we began to kind of well, work out the implications of that in the book. And along the way, obviously, we encountered a lot of Catholics who were uncomfortable taking religion out of the private realm and bringing it into the public square. And yet at the same time, you can see in the catechism, you can see in the documents of Vatican II and in the tradition where this is really not an option. The, tra the traditional teaching of the church is that Christ is the King of Kings. He's the Lord of Lords. And so as lay apostles, we've got to bear witness to that. And so worship is something that is a duty. It is also our salvation always and everywhere, which means it's, it's personal, it's private. It's also public and social. And we've just lost sight of that because of the tsunami of secularization that has swept over our civilization. And so advancing this and at the same time acknowledging a sort of spiritual Stockholm syndrome. You know, you think back to when that uh, bank was robbed and they had took hostages. And then when the prime minister finally ordered a kind of uh, a break in to, to, to take the hostages, free them, the hostages had basically sided with the robbers. And in the trial, uh, they they took aim at the, the government. And this is what psychologists ended up calling the Stockholm Syndrome, where you adopt yeah. the framework of your own enemies as a sort of coping mechanism. And what we discovered was, okay, most Catholic Christians in America, and I suspect Australia, don't even allow themselves to imagine what would it be like if we were to establish an order rooted in the law of God, in the kingdom of God, in the law of Christ? And when we were done with this book, I wasn't shocked, but I was pleased by the enthusiastic response and almost entirely positive reviews because a lot of people were like, wow, kind of never thought this way before. And then, you know, six months later, we begin to hear more and more people who are going back and reading it again or discussing it. And they all say the same thing. We're never going to live to see this. Our kids aren't either, you know, probably not even our grandkids. And for us, for Kimberly and me, we've got six kids and now 22 grandkids. And oh, so God. it mattered. And, you know, Brandon has a number of kids as well. And so we got back together again. 
for these prolonged discussions. And the conversations bore a lot of fruit. And so this book, Catholics in Exile, Biblical Wisdom for the Journey Home, is really the third part of the trilogy. It's the finale. So if you focus on living the grace of the sacrament of matrimony, you really can do what it is God has called you to do. And that is become a saint, raise a family, and depend upon the grace of Christ that the sacrament provides. And the other sacraments afford that as well. But it is right and just to sort of like lift up your hearts. You know, imagine what it would be like to have a Christian social order. Now, let me just pause and say something that you and I both know. The Catholic faith has this unique power to form civilizations. All religions do, but the Catholic faith has proven itself down through the ages to have this unique capacity to form civilizations of justice and love. You think of the 13th and 12th, 12th and 13th centuries, but other time periods and places as well. But that's counterbalanced by the fact that the Catholic faith is not primarily designed to form civilizations, but to form saints. And so yeah. if you're doing this just because you want the positive social consequences, you've sort of reversed the polarity of seek first the kingdom and these things will be added. And so what we want to do is to show people that we're here to become saints and we can do that in Christendom or in exile. At the same time, we ought to long to have a Christian social order so that more and more people might find it not easier, but more possible to become saints. So it isn't as though we're at cross purposes. But at the end of the day, what you begin to realize is that because the Catholic faith has this power to form civilizations, as well as saints, who are like signs of contradiction in every age, it also has this unique potential to form opposition, persecution, misunderstanding, misrepresentation, and set in motion the conditions for what we could describe in terms of exile. And exile, you know, what is exile? Well, at the most basic level, you know, exile is where you are forced out of your home country and you live as a stranger in a strange land. And so you can see it already in Genesis 3, verses 23 and 24, where our first parents are driven out of paradise and they're forced to kind of live outside of the presence of God. But that motif is enlarged. You begin to recognize the fact that, you know, Israel in Egyptian bondage, far from their own homeland, the promised land, and then the early church fathers pick up on the fact that this bondage into which we are born is a sign of original sin. So the Exodus event that brings them out of bondage and eventually into the promised land really is a sign of what Christ does for all of us through baptism. On the other hand, you'll find in Leo the Great and some other fathers that exile, that is, when Israel went into exile to the Assyrians in 722, Judea went into the Babylonian exile around 587. Uh, that is sort of the spiritual equivalent for committing actual sins. So we're born into the bondage of original sin, which baptism liberates us from, but we're also then trapped by our own sins, by our own personal sins and the habits that form around them. And I, I, I find this useful because I think the urge to want to create a, a Christian social order is, is almost entirely right. But the idea is this. We look around and we realize, okay, look at the state of our culture. Look at the state of the church. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're tempted to either give into despair or just give into anger or some combination. Uh, you might just say, oh, nostalgia. We ought to go back to the preconciliar period. Or we ought to go back to the 1200s, you know, when you have a, a Catholic social order. But nostalgia is paralyzing. It doesn't help at all. And likewise, giving in to despair, anxiety, or anger, it's understandable, but it's paralyzing. It's pointless. And so you want to figure out, okay, what sort of biblical theological strategy is going to prove to be the most effective for living in a culture that is profoundly secularized and living in a church that is profoundly divided. And that's what this book Catholics in Exile is all about because 
I suspect that almost as much as in America today, you're experiencing this down in Australia as well and everywhere else. Fraser, thank you. Thank you for doing this. Um, uh, it is, as I said, so timely and it does complete uh, almost this trilogy. So uh, I, love, I love how you've pieced that together. Um, would you recommend reading them in that order? So the, the First Society, the Right and Just and Exile, or does it, does it matter? Read this now. Is there a particular order you, you recommend reading these? No, the, the, the chronological sequence of the books is not necessarily the best pedagogical sequence. You okay. know, uh, in fact, I think because of how events have come down upon us, I think most people would probably feel more of a productive, I mean, I, Catholics in Exile is basically addressing the state where we find ourselves today. And mm -hmm. so I would recommend this as a really good starting point. Uh, again, in order to avoid, you know, avoid that the despair and retreating out of the world, or again, avoiding the anger and the cynicism that would cause you just simply to find blame. When you play the blame game, they say it's a lose-lose proposition. And so this book is designed to give people practical, personal, and productive ways to cope and to actually set into motion some positive graces and forces that will lead you, your children, your grandchildren, along with your godchildren, your family members and friends, into something that will put you on a trajectory or a path to holiness. Yeah, wow, beautiful. Now, this book here, um, Catholic Zenegal, has 15 chapters. You have cover um, from violence of envy, away from home, the exodus and the liturgical pilgrimage, the Jeremiah option. Can we, can we, can we maybe just touch on a couple of these par um, chapters sure. and, and just to break over the, the Jeremiah option? What, what, what does that mean? Can you touch on that? Why, why is there a chapter on the Jeremiah option? What is that option? Well, you know, we have a, a Christian writer in America who spoke of the Benedict option, referring mm -hmm. to St. Benedict and the Benedictines. And I read it and I enjoyed it. Uh, what he was describing that I think everybody could agree on was the sense that we're pilgrims, that we're in the diaspora. Uh, now, the term diaspora is an English term that refers to being dispersed among peoples that are not your own. But technically, the Greek term diaspora means the scattering or the sowing of seed. And so from a human perspective, we're dispersed. But from a divine perspective, we're like the seed that is sown by the sower. And so we are where God wants us to be, even if we don't want to be here. And this is where Jeremiah found himself. And so what we call the Jeremiah option is really something of a foundation for the entire book. Uh, Jeremiah is alive at the time of the Babylonian captivity, so he really is the prophet of the exile. Though he wasn't driven into exile originally, he ends up being one of the exiles. But already in Jeremiah 24, after the Babylonians have swept through Judea and taken out a number of the, the Jews into captivity, the rulers in Jerusalem basically assume that they are divinely favored because we've been left behind. We're still flourishing. And so Jeremiah writes this, uh, this letter to the rulers of Jerusalem based upon a vision that he has of two baskets of figs, one good figs and one rotten, one basket of rotten figs. And the rulers assume that they're the good ones because they've been preserved. He says it's the exact opposite. You're corrupt you've also really been complicit in idolatry, infidelity. And in fact, the ones that God sent into exile are the apple of his eye. He is watching over them. He is purifying them. He is loving them in their own hardship. He's hearing their prayer. And so if you have any hope of redemption, it will be through the redemptive suffering of these good figs who are in exile. He basically turned everything upside down you know, especially from the century before when Isaiah had described the remnant as simply those who were spared in Jerusalem. But he also set things right because he sets into motion the way of thinking that is rooted in the covenant, that the covenant is basically a divine and sacred kinship bond 
whereby God is a father. He gives us the laws that he knows will perfect us. If we break the laws, we sin, but sin is more than broken laws. It's the broken lives. It's the broken hearts. It's the broken homes that we're running throughout this secularized society. So he punishes his people through the exile, but not to get back at them, but to get them back to him. And so by the time you get to Jeremiah 29, you really begin to see it with 2020 clarity. Because there in Jeremiah 29, and I remember when I first met Kimberly, one of her all-time favorite verses, it might have even been her life verse was 2911. For I know the plans that I have for you, says the Lord, plans for welfare, not for woe, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me. But verse 11 only comes at the end of a series of verses where Jeremiah is laying out seven necessary steps that you have to take if you're going to survive exile and you're going to discover God's purpose for it. And the first one is build houses and live in them. So there in Jeremiah 29 verse 5, build houses and live in them. Okay, what does that mean? Well, I think the inclination might have been to rent apartments or to build tents, you know, and just kind of bide your time and hope to get back as soon as possible. But no, Jeremiah had already indicated it's going to be 70 years, which ended up being protracted even longer. And so build houses and live in them. Think with a future orientation. The second step is, I love this one, plant gardens and eat the produce. In other words, get to work. Get your hands dirty. Get some dirt in your fingernails. There's nothing undignified about hard labor. In fact, this will be the instrument by which you know, you're sanctified. So plant these crops and at the same time, enjoy the produce from the gardens and you can enjoy that. The third step, I think in some ways is also surprising and that is take wives and have sons and daughters. So you're not just in this survival mode you are basically being told to be fruitful and multiply, which was God's purpose for humans in the beginning. So you end up taking wives and having sons and daughters so that it's really a family-centered project here. So you raise your family. But then the fourth step builds upon the third, take wives for your sons and daughters. And in other words, think now in terms of the generations. So yeah. take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage so you're not just planting the crop for the winter to have, you know, something to eat when it's cold outside. You're, you're building, you're planting forests so that you'll have the lumber. You, you won't even live to see it. Kids, your grandkids hopefully will. And so as you begin to think in, th you're thinking in terms that go beyond election cycles. You go beyond like the cable news cycle as well. <laughs> So that you rise above the dark clouds and you begin to realize, okay, this is really what is the most meaningful part of life. Build houses, plant gardens, get married, raise kids, see your kids have kids. And I think what he's done in the set, set in emotion something that the fifth step is almost predictable. That is multiply there and do not decrease. Be fruitful and multiply. This is God's will for his people everywhere or anywhere. Number six is seek the welfare of the city to which the Lord your God has driven you. And the word for welfare is shalom, something rooted in the covenant. So that there really is a sense of a missionary role on the part of the exiles. You know, I've often said to immigrants who have come in to our country that are seen as, you know, foreigners, they're immigrants. I'm like, no. You're missionaries, especially if you're from Mexico. You know Our Lady of Guadalupe. Most Americans don't. Most American Catholics don't. Yeah. And so have this missionary spirit where you're building houses, you're planting gardens, you're getting married, you're having kids, you're encouraging your kids to have kids, and you're basically seeking the shalom, the welfare of the city, just like Kimberly has been for the last eight years. And when we stopped homeschooling after 26 years, and we were empty nesters, she ran for office. She served two terms, that's all you're allowed. But she set in motion something that our town had not seen before. Uh, she was a Republican on the conservative side in a very democratic town. And she was running against an incumbent who was a native son of the town. And he announced that it was gonna be a landslide. Well, he was right. It turned out to be a landslide for her 
because she spent six months knocking on 7,000 doors. And there are only 7,000 doors in the town of Steubenville to knock on. She was going into the inner city. She was going into the outlying areas, all the neighborhoods, knocking and listening. Her motto became ready to listen, ready to lead. And she was a shoe in the second term. But she did it again, all 7,000 doors for several months because she just wanted to be like the leaven in the loaf and bring people together. And she was honored and recognized twice now in the last month as she concluded her second and final term. And, and we've been doing other things too in town. I, I travel too much to really be ready to lead or ready to listen and ready to lead. But uh, that to me embodies the spirit of the sixth step. Well, that leads us to the seventh and final step of the Jeremiah option. Jeremiah 29, he says, finally, pray. Pray. Well, why shouldn't that be first? Well, pray to the Lord on your behalf, but pray to the Lord on behalf of the city, again, mm -hmm. that he's driven you into. Okay, prayer. Well, wait a second. How do you do that? Because Jerusalem's in ruins. The temple is destroyed. There is no pilgrim feasts, no animal sacrifices, no Levitical clergy, no ironic high priests. Everything's been decimated, which just kept happening. It, it got worse and worse throughout Jeremiah's lifetime and beyond. So, you know, you're in Babylon. What can you do? Well, maybe all you can do is to light a Sabbath candle and to sing some of the Psalms and then to pray and teach your heart, teach your wife, teach your children to trust the Lord because he wants to bless you in a foreign land. And, you know, this is almost unimaginable for us because as, as, as secularized as our society is, it's still our society. But to be uprooted and forced to live in cultures, I mean, our forebears have experienced that, but usually within one generation, you know, the second generation, the children or the grandchildren have learned the language, they've assimilated the culture, you know, and so when we see Mexicans coming to America, a dear friend of mine, my, my teaching assistant, was just telling me his grandparents are so devout. His parents are practicing. But, you know, those kids who are his contemporaries are like, yeah, just simply cultural Catholics. Mm. And, and this is what happened to the Jews as well until they took the Jeremiah option. Then they began to realize, okay, the Sabbath, but not just the last day of the week, every day prayer, but not just private, but public. And so they began to create the synagogue system, the rabbinic system of learning and education, the rabbinic courts as well, so that they learned how to flourish under the most adverse circumstances down to the present time. And I, I think we could learn some lessons from not only the prophet Jeremiah, but from Judaism in the diaspora that has found a lot of ways to prosper not just financially, but also in some cases, spiritually. I won't go into it because we decided not to put into the book, but um, the, the the movement known as the Lubavitchers, uh, the Reeb, you know, you have Rabbi Schneerson. Some thought he was the Messiah, but he set an emotion that kind of joyful celebration of the Jewish faith with the Sabbath candles and other things too, reaching out to non-practicing secularized Jews Invite them to enjoy a kosher meal. Don't impose more than they can live out. Don't be legalistic or hypercritical, but just welcome them through hospitality and joy. And you have seen an explosion, an exponential multiplication of Orthodox Jews, not only in New York City, but elsewhere as well. Wow. And I, I think that what they've done is actually to tap into something that isn't simply the Jeremiah option, but the Great Commission. Go into all nations and make them disciples of Christ. That's so good. I love it. Um, the seven steps uh, from Jeremiah, so people can read that. Uh, and uh, that, that is brilliant. You, you, you spell that out. Is it in that chapter? It's in another chapter. You can just spell it's out. It's actually spread seven throughout steps. the whole book. Yeah. book. So the whole framework. That's beautiful. It is. Um, you, you touch on um, uh, the long game. So can you oh, yeah. long uh, talk us there, chapter 10? The long game, and, yeah. and, and this really is something to help us, I guess, uh, stay grounded and, and focused on on that. Because as you say, we don't just follow news cycles and and uh, <laughs> uh, political cycles, but we are here for for heaven. Uh, after like our home is not here on earth, but it's in it's in the New Jerusalem. So, um, what is the yeah. long game, and and how how do we stay focused? 
Well, I mean, you just asked me about the Jeremiah option, which is my favorite chapter. And I think Brandon's yeah. too. Then chapter 10, that's my next favorite chapter because <laughs> we introduced Cardinal Stefan Wyszynski, who was this, this Polish patriarch, the primate of Poland, but during the period of persecution under the Nazis and then under the Soviets. And many people have observed that if it weren't for the venerable Cardinal Stefan Wyszynski, there probably couldn't have been a Pope St. John Paul II. So wow. we think of John Paul as being the spiritual father of the Polish Catholics in the 20th century. But they see Wyszynski. They see what John Paul saw that this leadership that came through all kinds of opposition, all kinds of, I mean, secular communism as well as Nazism, but he, uh, his emphasis was on living the faith as much as you human, as much as humanly possible. But it was also uh, work. He had this mm. insight into how God uses hard work, work that you're doing, striving for excellence, as the instrument of our sanctification. Now, I'm a supernumerary in Opus Dei. And so for me, this is like the air I breathe from St. Jose Maria Escriva mm -hmm. and everybody else in the work, the cooperators, the numeraries, the supernumeraries, and it's really spread. But before it was spread, you know, through the apostolate of Opus Dei, it was lived in the worst of times by Wyszynski. And in the process, he was not only mentoring young men like Karl Wojtyla, the later, you know, later to become John Paul II, but he was restoring a supernatural faith, hope, love, endurance, what you would call longanimity. That is, we're not running a sprint, it's a marathon. So train yourself, think in terms of the long term, and thus, you know, work in the factories. They created the underground seminary system that John Paul passed through and other things too. And so it seems to me that the number of works of his that have already been translated, proving to be inspiring to people like me and to Brandon. And uh, this is why I would say that the example of Wyszynski and his book, The Spirit of Human Work in particular, is destined to inspire generations of Catholics. I mean, for centuries to come. Wow. Uh, he's venerable. It wouldn't surprise me if he became a saint in my own lifetime. But uh, what he really loved to do was to inspire hope and confidence so that people could endure the most, the worst of times. Wow, oh, beautiful. As you're saying, I mean, the timing he lived, and I just can't help think, and you, know, you touch on St. Jose Maria, you know, the Spanish Civil War in the, in the mid, oh, yeah. you got the mid 20s going on. Around the similar time, you got the Mexican Revolution and then the whole uh, Cristiada War, and you got. Uh, Blessed uh, Miguel Pro in that time and rising over in, over in Germany <laughs> and Pope uh, Cardinal Ratzinger, <laughs> who then becomes Pope Benedict. You're just thinking, oh, my goodness, God has not during this time. It doesn't matter how dire it gets. It doesn't matter how difficult it can become. God is still raising saints and we need those saints in those times. And, and what more than now? And, and who are the saints for now, for today? And um, he's done it before. He's done it over and over again in the past. And his, he'll do it again. You know, Charbel, near the beginning of our conversation, I think you used the word polarization. And I think we're finding yes. ourselves polarized, not only in the culture, but also in our diocese and in our own parish and sometimes even in our own families. Yes. You also just brought up the fact that St. Jose Maria went through the Spanish Civil War and uh, Miguel Pro, blessed Miguel Pro, went through this Mexican war that was so bloody. I remember talking to people who were in Opus Dei, who lived through that difficult period. You know, I, I became a cooperator a year before I became a Catholic. And so back in oh, 85, wow. there were some old timers that I would meet up with on retreats. And what I found out just from one or two of them was that uh, this was true back then, that in the parish, but also in your family, and frequently in your own marriage, you would have those who were Republicans who were really siding with, you know, the communists and others with Franco and the military trying to preserve a traditional Catholic culture. And they would have a, a difficult time talking to each other. You know, so what did you do? Well, 
there there has to be a certain latitude, a certain degree of respect, you know, especially before you are at war. Uh, and, and so chapter 12 is my next favorite chapter because what we discover there is that we share the holy sacrifice of the mass. We might not share common views on politics or economics or what will the be, what what is the best strategy to deal with you know um, the Republican you know with the, the communist and that sort of thing. So you have Jacques Maritain taking the side of the communists and the Republicans. You know Garrigou Lagrange taking the side, and and so the divisions are not going to go away just with an encyclical. So what do you do? You go to mass, you offer yourself in the holy sacrifice, you receive holy communion, and you recognize that in lifting up our hearts, we're, we're seeing the things that unite us, that are worse than the storm that is dividing us. And it seems like, you know, Karl Marx is the one who coined the expression, the engine of history. But he was talking about who owns the means of production. He was a materialist and he was applying the Hegelian dialectic to the whole process of economic conflict. It's, it, it's almost entirely false, demonic, I would say. But the idea of an engine of history, for us as believers, you and I both know that the engine of history is worship. It is the liturgy. You can see this when Israel is enslaved in Egypt. What is it that liberates them? Well, the first nine plagues are God, you know, basically displaying his supremacy over the, the gods of Egypt. But the 10th one actually required obedience on the part of the Israelites to slaughter the lamb, to sprinkle the blood, to eat the communion, the sacrificial communion, and then to flee. So what really freed them was the Passover liturgy. And when they finally arrived at the at Mount Sinai, it wasn't to seal a constitution, it was to renew a covenant. And so over 80% of the laws in Exodus have to do with worship, liturgy, priestly vestments, the altar, the Ark of the Covenant, you know, the tabernacle, the different courts. It's like, save the papyrus. I mean, what's the point of emphasizing the liturgy so overly <laughs> much unless it's not? And so you discover that Getting the first law right, you know, what is the greatest commandment? To love the Lord your God with all of your heart, mind, soul, and strength. This is really where uh, Catholics in exile flows right out of it is right and just. Because in the apocalypse, we show that the, the liturgy of the angels and saints corresponds exactly to what we call the mass. I pointed this out in the Lamb's Supper. But this is what will get the church yes. through all of the periods of persecution that she faces down through the ages until the very eschaton, until the end of time. And so if we prepare ourselves and our loved ones to disagree on certain things that matter, but to really agree on the things that matter most, and that is the living God and the fact that he has established a covenant and called us to renew it through love. And that is expressed in the liturgy. And so let's just, you know, we'll put our coats by the door, but we'll also put our political differences there as much as possible and just really plunge our lives together into the holy sacrifice of Christ at Calvary and upon the altar. And we'll see how it is that the Lord of history will get us through times that look impossible. Yeah. Amen. Well, it's so interesting. I, that was going to be the next chapter I was going to pick and you touched on it. And I'm so grateful you have <laughs> um, liberation and liturgy <laughs> um, because it is, I, I understand um, it's beautiful. People understand the idea of, of, of sacrifice. So Christ has offered himself on the altar of the cross and we get to participate in that and even share in that and even yeah. our own lives become a, a, an altar. Whatever work we are, you know, we're offering our sacrifices to, to God the Father um, and we can do that. Now, during uh, this is where it gets a bit technical for some and sometimes we can't even, we just got to go to Mass Let's, and we get caught up in, oh, which mass do we go to? And so some people, and I remember personally, I remember um, during COVID, it was very difficult. Churches, certain churches were closed and certain churches <laughs> were open. And so then there were certain priests who were willing to come to people's homes and there were certain priests that just wanted to follow <laughs> the law of the land. And, and so there was an explosion, I guess, during the, the, um, the COVID time. And I have to admit a resurgence of what I've noticed um, 
is a form of tradition has, has renewed in the last few years, more so in my lifetime. Um, I remember 20 years ago, you know, there was maybe one or two uh, traditional masses. Uh, now there's, there's dozens and dozens uh, just in Sydney. And then, then I start understanding around the world, there seems to be a movement uh, and you can't deny this. And we're talking about the long game. And, and I, just, I just want to reverse back as we commemorate Cardinal Pell right now. Uh, Cardinal Pell uh, was someone who, who, who really thought of the long game. And, you know, we are remembering him a year, a year on uh, from his death. And mm. um, what he put in place in Melbourne and then what he put in place in Sydney and then later on in the global church, universal church, we're seeing the fruits of that. We're seeing the, I guess, the blessings of that. And I, it just hit me to, about two months ago, these, this research, if I look at all the ordinations of the priesthood, it just in, just, I can only talk about Sydney right now, but the last 15 years, 15 to 20 years, the, the, almost all of them, pretty much all of them, have come through with a, a, loyal, uh, a loyalty to the magisterium of the church, its teachings, a love for Our Lady, a love for the Eucharist. They, they don't mind being called Father. They're, they wear their cassocks. They wear their collars in the public. They know scripture. They, they are familiar with the church teachings and their teaching. There's an enthusiasm. There's a joy. There's, 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 they're normal. You know, they, you can hang out with them and have a beer at the same time. They, they, they will listen to your confession at, at a drop of a hat. Um, there's something that is exciting that's happening under our very eyes, under our very nose in the last 15 years, and we're seeing the fruits. And I'm thinking about someone who saw the long game, Cardinal Pell, um, and here we are. And I feel like we're at the, although it feels like it's going to get worse in the short term, it feels like it's going to get better in the medium and long term. And, uh, and so I'm filled with this renewed hope right now. And, and your book comes at a time when I can read this and say, I can see now what God is doing in, in a time Amen. when we do feel alone. So just a comment, I guess, on um, I guess the state of the church, but, but also, uh, you know, the, 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 there is a polarizing divide liturgically, um, some, what, what, whatever people's views are about the Pope or, or their own bishops or their own priests. I mean, it, it, this is nothing new under the sun, again. Um, but how do we cope at a time when people aren't even agreeing on what church or what mass to go to? And, and, and so how do, what sort of advice could you give many, many of those watching now? Well, I think what we need to do is to gain this perspective as Catholics that recognizes the, um, that the Catholic Church is not Catholic because it's global or planetary or international. It's Catholic because it's universal. And mm -hmm. so in heaven, where the angels and the saints worship God and see the face of their father and the Blessed Virgin and all the martyrs, you know, that is not a different denomination than what we have down here in the Vatican. It is the mystical body of Christ, and Christ is the head of the church. And as St. Thomas Aquinas explains, the Pope in Rome, as the Bishop of Rome and the successor to Peter, is certainly the head of the church on earth, but that's temporary. And it's also limited to a form of jurisdiction that relates only to the church militant, not to the church triumphant, and not to the church suffering. But there aren't three churches, there is one. And mm -hmm. ultimately, the sacrifice of the mass is our earthly participation in the heavenly worship where there isn't incense there's not technically an altar there's certainly not a lamb and yet the liturgy of the saints and angels is described precisely in terms that we can recognize for the purpose of our uniting our hearts and lifting them up to heaven and so once we get that straight we'll realize why has the lord allowed the mass to not be a monolith you've got the melkite you got the maronite you've got all of the different, and, and it's a diversity that doesn't in any way subvert the unity. If anything, it displays it, it enriches it, it, it purifies it. Okay, so I understand the problems and the questions of the Novus Ordo done poorly, but when it's done right, it's a valid mass. And if it's a valid mass, it unites heaven and earth. I have discovered the traditional Latin mass in our own parish downtown. And I must admit, while I'm more at home in the Novus Ordo, uh, I, I am really captured by the reverence, the transcendence, the antiquity. It, I just feel like it puts me in my place. Um, but the Noah's Ordo, when it's done right, and in our parish at 10 o'clock, you've got the Adorientum and all of them. You've got 
we receive Holy Communion on the altar rail in all of the Masses. Likewise, Kimberly's in the choir, Gregorian chant, polyphony. But regardless, I mean, if it's done that beautifully or if it's done on the top of a Jeep on a battlefield, we have to recognize that the Eucharistic liturgy unites God and man. It unites heaven and earth. It unites time and eternity. And it's the thing that's going to get us home. And so, you know, if that's the case, if we really are surrounded by angels and saints, then instead of just imposing liturgical rules, which have their place to be sure, let's just ask ourselves, wait a second, if this is the sacred mystery of where we are and who we're with, then we ought to think through how to dress accordingly and how to arrange the furniture as well as the music, mm. and the altar and everything else, you know, without, I mean, there's a time and a place for those norms to be imposed and enforced. But in the meantime, we don't have to wait for that. Uh, we can prepare ourselves, our family members, our friends, just to enter with deeper reverence and much greater joy. And I think we'd be shocked to see what our guardian angels can see. And that is that we are like little you know, pebbles in the pond that send forth ripples of grace wider and wider that are going to affect change. You know, the fact is, if we were alive at the time of Innocent III and the Fourth Lateran Council and St. Francis and St. Dominic, and things were just flourishing, the King of France is going to be a canonizable saint someday. I think what Innocent III, St. Francis and St. Dominic would all whisper in our ears is, no matter how beautiful it is, guess what? We're in exile. We're not home yet. Because if God is our father, then he, we are his family. But if he is in heaven, then we're pilgrims, sojourners, whatever you want to call our wayfaring state. We are the pilgrim church in via. And yet the eschatological glory of the church is the only thing that we will ever know as our true homeland. And I think that kind of thing is just sanctified common sense. That is the best therapy because it's the reality of what we profess to be true and it is the truth. And once we see it, we realize, okay, this isn't us ratcheting up our religious rhetoric in order to kind of cope with secularization. This being ignored is what caused secularization. And mm -hmm. so the only antidote is to come back to our faith and not just profess it, but allow ourselves and our marriage to be possessed and defined by these sacred mysteries. Yeah, wow, beautiful, beautiful. I remember uh, just we had um, Matt Frad not too long ago over in Australia, and he himself uh, touched on this, had questions about this. And, but it was some, some great advice and, and, and just asked for some commentary as we, we're closing here soon. Um, but, yeah, being in control. So control the things you can control. So as fathers, That's right. we can control, you know, our domestic home. And don't, um, I mean, of course we can worry, but don't, don't, don't get yourself, <laughs> if there's certain things that we cannot control, don't spend all, hours and hours of your day worrying about them, talking about them when nothing can change. And so that's, that's, that's the right. danger I mean, where we can fall ourselves into. In America, we distinguish between the sphere of concern, which is nearly universal. There's so much to be concerned about. And the secular yes. news, ecclesiastical news, mm. ecclesiastical gossip for that matter as well. And so you know, I've got a close friend who has said something that I try to really stick by. And that is, you know, he said, Scott, the only liturgical abuse that I notice is when I receive Holy Communion. Mm -hmm. uh, and if God can set in motion the forces of sanctifying us, then he can use us at his own rate and his, in his own way to bring that to other people. But I do believe that by focusing on the things that I can change in my own life, my own heart, my own home, and even that's hard, but it's far more possible than trying to affect change. And this is why we have to recognize if the Catholic Church on earth, it's a big tent. You know, as James Joyce said after converting, here comes everybody. So we've really got to be recognizing not only the liberty that all of us have as lay people, but the authority that God has invested with the hierarchy and the divine patience with them putting that into practice. I mean, in the meantime, you know, I, I think we have enough grace to get home and to become saints in the process. Yeah, praise God. Thank you. Um, I think just finally, the very last chapter, if we can just, just fast forward and just close closing comments here, sure. um, is, and I will give you rest. Um, and so it's on in chapter 15, page 171 in the book. And uh, 
this whole idea of, yeah, we will be given rest from our Lord. Can you touch on this? What's this about? And then this and closing comments uh, for today. Yeah, it really is part of a three chapter cluster. Come to me, chapter 13, all who labor and are heavy laden, 14, and I will give you rest, 15. So we recognize the teaching of our Lord there in Matthew 11. Uh, and what we're also doing is sort of building upon the Jeremiah option, as well as the teaching of Cardinal Wojcicki. If Catholics simply lived the Lord's day, you know, you look at the Decalogue, and the third commandment is the last in the first table. Remember the, the Sabbath day to keep it holy. And then six days you work on the seventh, you rest. But it's the only time holy occurs in the entire Decalogue. Mm -hmm. And so for us on the other side of the cross and resurrection, for us to live the Lord's Day, not just one hour every Sunday, but to prepare for the Mass, and then to really continue on basking in the graces that we have received in the Holy Sacrifice and through Holy Communion, uh, just by prioritizing you know, prayer personally, as a family as well the family rosary, also some rest and recreation. It isn't legalistic, you know, but on the other hand, I try not to employ people so that they have to go to work on Sunday because I feel like I have to go to that particular restaurant. Again, not legalistic, but liberty. And when I think of D.A.'s Domini, what John Paul II wrote on keeping the Lord's Day holy, I believe that Christ wants to give us this supernatural rest that will also transform our marriages and our families. So we've tried our best for 44 years of marriage to live the Lord's day with joy, without kind of creating a list of rules of do's and don'ts. But in the process, I really do believe that we and other families too, in their own way, can do that which we need to sort of reset our economic work, as well as the social order, and just allow first things to be first. And that is the Lord God, the Lord of history, the mass, and the rest of our work week as well. Praise God. Thank you. Well, um, I want to thank you for your time. This is, uh, it's been wonderful to, to chat with you again and, and very excited about this book. I think it's so needed. Uh, Catholics in Exile, Biblical Wisdom for the Journey Home. Let us never forget our, our home isn't here on earth. We are in exile and that should give us yeah. peace. <laughs> um, Thank you so much. It is now available and great to announce, along with all of all the books, the, the trilogy, along with, uh, and people may see behind me, and all the other books that Emmaus wrote, and the Perusia Media website, so perusiamedia.com. And those watching in America, go to uh, Emmaus Road or go to St. Paul Center. It all, the links are all there. You have about three or four websites, Dr. Hahn, but which one would we point to to know more about uh, what you're doing? Well, I mean, the St. Paul Center go to the homepage and check out Emmaus okay. Academy. We now have at least 20 courses on St. Paul, awesome. on the Gospels, on the Prophets, on the Psalms, on prayer, as well as on Tolkien's liturgical imagination done by Dr. Yeah. Ben Reinhardt, a brilliant lecture. And by the way, Charbel, I wanna just say for everyone that I am grateful, so deeply thankful for the partnership with Perusia Media and the St. Paul Center. Because our friendship goes way back, and this is really rooted in the friendship that we've shared. Uh, thank you so much. Um, God bless you, uh, uh, Dr. Han, and, and uh, we're praying for you. And I encourage everyone to visit uh, the St. Paul Center website. Uh, check it out, share it. Uh, and if you're inclined to even donate, support the ministry, please do that and go to that website. Thanks for supporting this uh, uh, podcast and the, everything we're doing at Perusia. Again, like always, subscribe, uh, click the bell, share with your family and friends. Thanks, everyone, for this excellent and, I guess, inspiring podcast. Uh, thank you again. Until next time, God bless.